This episode is brought to you by the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois, and the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, Germany. Hey, we are here in the National Park Unteres Oratal, and Poland is right there. We can see it. Also, my feet are freezing. Let's go. People have been cultivating grain and farming cattle in the Oder Valley for more than 7,000 years. Alteration of the land ramped up in the early 19th century and continued through the 1990s. During the 1970s, industrialization and expanded agricultural practices had a huge impact on transforming the region. Then, the political changes in 1990 allowed for the area to be set aside and protected, and the Lower Oder Valley National Park was established in 1995. And uh, when the National Park was founded, it was decided uh, that uh, here no uh, agriculture will be done no more. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, area will uh, develop uh, naturally. This is Dr. Karl Heinz Vermolt, the curator of the Animal Sound Archive for the Museum for Naturkunde. Today, he's going to take us into the field to show us how scientists collect field recordings in wetlands to learn more about the animals that call them home. But first, a little background. The Animal Sound Archive at the Museum for Naturkunde was established in 1951, and in the last 70 years, scientists have contributed more than 120,000 recordings to this collection. And many of these sounds can now be heard from anywhere in the world, as scientists at the museum work to move their collection from tapes to digital online archives. The first recordings were made in 1951 by Professor Günther Tempok and uh, this was a part of a behavioral study. On October 30th, 1951, Günther Temprock uh, simply tested uh, the tape recorder. And during this time, uh, we had uh, uh, a housing for, uh, for owls uh, uh, in the garden, and uh, one of uh, the tawny owls started uh, to cry. And uh, uh, when uh, this tawny owl was calling, a wild tawny uh, owl came and uh, was uh, duetting uh, with uh, the captive one. Wow, that's amazing. And he caught I, it all on the recording. We have the recording and uh, we can uh, then listen to this record. some wildlife activity here. This is evidence of a wild boar. Apparently they use their nose to dig into the mud, make a big mess. We might see one today. That would be exciting. I uh, think I could handle it. No, me versus boar. Anyway. We have a second sighting of evidence of boar. It's their little trail. I think if I follow it, I could go find him. See you, no, I'm back, okay, I got the other stuff to do, I gotta go. We have a third piece of evidence from the wild boar. Some uh, hoof prints here heading that way, which is maybe east, I don't actually know. Um, and some roe deer hoofs. But I appreciate how this video, which is supposed to be about a bioacoustic library, has become in search of the wild boar. It wasn't in the script. Eh, let's get back to Carl. Did you use this? Yes, I have used this. Wow, for your own field recordings. For own field recordings. And how much does this store? Like, how, how long could you record you, you, this? Usually, uh, you can. Uh, uh, with high quality, uh, with good quality, uh, approximately 30 minutes. Usually uh, the batteries uh, don't last uh, more than uh, 30, 40 minutes. Really? But uh, it was uh, already a uh, large uh, advantage uh, in comparison uh, with uh, yeah. uh, the gramophone technology. <laughs> where you had uh, to go uh, with the gramophone to the animal and uh, this was almost impossible. The first uh, tape recorders of uh, this uh, kind uh, were used uh, by the CIA. So spies. So for, 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 yes, for spies. And uh, the advantage of uh, this is, of course, it's, it's much, lighter. much smaller, much uh, lighter. And uh, the recording uh, uh, quality was extremely good. During the winter, you always have the problems uh, that the batteries uh, will be cold. Oh. And uh, you could uh, put uh, the recorder inside uh, 
uh, your pocket yeah. and it will be warm. Uh, but uh, a disadvantage uh, was it uh, was easier uh, to work uh, with the tapes, to cut the large tapes, than to cut uh, the small tapes. Oh, okay. So this was just for spying and for... For field work it's, uh, Yeah, for field work. For field work, it's excellent. But mostly spies. You have um, this nifty little box here today too. This is um, something that you're you're actually using today to record field work. Yeah, it is uh, for uh, doing continuous recordings. We, for this purpose, uh, use uh, this uh, small recorder. Yeah. This is not the usual way uh, to, yeah. for power supply. Wow. It's self-made. Usually you have here two small batteries wow. and can uh, record uh, with uh, this uh, small uh, digital recorder. So this, you could record for 30 minutes. Yeah. How long could you record on this? Approximately one hour. One hour, and then you're going to 32 gigs. It can record for 48 two hours. For two days, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Well, we have used uh, this uh, equipment uh, to look if uh, uh, corn cracks are present. This is very important uh, since uh, the corn crack is a rare species mm -hmm. and uh, when a corn crack is uh, detected in a meadow, uh, the meadow will not be used until a certain time. Really? So this is what you're putting out there now in these wetland environments to get an idea of, of what's living there? At, at, least, at least one way. Okay, Carl, where are we now? We are now at this place uh, where we are doing our acoustic monitoring. Okay. We have here a long-term uh, uh, recorder and uh, this recording uh, device is uh, working uh, now almost uh, 10 months uh, without wow. any break. Really? Yes, so the only break is uh, when we are changing the batteries and the memory cards. Okay. And uh, the idea is uh, why we have uh, placed the recorder here. Uh, in front, uh, we have uh, the open space uh, uh, we, where we have uh, uh, water birds uh, breeding, and it's uh, one place uh, we, where we have uh, a high concentration of spotted crakes, for example. And those are rare birds in this area? or? These are, again, in general, rare birds. We have recorded uh, uh, spotted crakes three days earlier than any ornithologist in uh, Germany has reported a, a wow. spotted crake. Since we recorded this, Carl found another recording showing that the spotted crake had actually migrated to the area 13 days earlier than ornithologists had initially observed, which is a pretty big deal when you're trying to track an endangered species. Well, I love that, that this work is being proactive and you're recording it now with the idea that future generations are going to be utilizing the animal sound library and helping to uh, analyze that information and learn stuff about what you've recorded here today. Yes, uh, no, we al already started uh, yeah. to use the sound library for developing uh, recognizing uh, algorithms. Great. Well, you should probably change those batteries. Yes. Okay. But... So what are some of the observations that you've made by analyzing this information? Uh, we have already analyzed uh, data for some breeding seasons and uh, at least 60 uh, species of uh, breeding birds could be detected on the sound recordings. Wow. That seems like a lot of information to go through though. Are you coming back here then to your lab every night and having to go through the recordings or are you relying on volunteers or, or how are you um, ultimately analyzing this information? Uh, you're right, it's uh, really a challenge to analyze uh, this huge information. Up to now, uh, we can uh, only estimate uh, as a real uh, species composition uh, by listening uh, to uh, the recordings. Wow. And uh, the other way is uh, to develop some algorithms for automated analysis using uh, pattern recognition algorithms. Mm -hmm. It works uh, not perfect, okay. uh, but uh, at least the algorithm uh, give us a good indication yeah. if uh, the bird uh, will be here. Oh, that is a large battery. Oh my God, this, is, this has to be at least 10 pounds. Almost 20. Oh my God. <laughs> you hike this, I guess you have to. You hiked it all the way with it. I, didn't, I wasn't carrying anything. I wasn't even helping. Now we are recording. Oh, there it goes. 
We're back. It's the next round. Good. For another month. Back at it. Why am I still holding this battery? I don't know. When we only want uh, to check if uh, a certain species is there, uh, one channel recording or a stereo recording is uh, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when we want uh, to estimate uh, um, the density of birds, uh, we uh, use a four-channel setup. You can uh, exactly estimate uh, the, the direction from which an animal is calling. And uh, when you use a setup, Mm -hmm. of different four-channel recordings, uh, you can make a triangulation and uh, then exactly localize as a bird. So you can, in, you just kind of have a 360 acoustic understanding of, of where everything might be positioned rather yeah. than um, just hearing things on either side and not knowing if it's in front of you or, or behind That's you. That's right. So you mentioned um, that that first recording that uh, was made back in 1951, anybody can listen to online. So is it just that recording or how much of this information is available to the public and why digitize it in the first place? Digitizing uh, the tape recordings is uh, the only way for conservation of uh, tape recordings. Yeah. Up to now, we have uh, digitized uh, almost 96% wow. of all the analog tapes. And uh, I expect uh, that uh, we will finish uh, the process of uh, digitizing within the next uh, two years. That's amazing. And uh, up, uh, we have in total approximately uh, 120,000 uh, recordings. Wow. And uh, up to now, uh, we have approximately uh, 30,000 or 35,000 recordings online. Oh, that's fantastic. So our audience could go on to the library today and listen to some of the older recordings or even the more recent recordings. Yeah, there's no need to come here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. come and say hi to Carl, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but and, and, and to look at, on uh, the magnetic tapes. Yeah, which are very cool, by the way. Um, but that's, I think that's fantastic that you're making such a, um, an effort to preserve this information, to make it available for people, and to um, you know, inspire the next generation of, of people who want to use these techniques to monitor areas, not just in Germany, but anywhere in the world. Worldwide. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Before we go, I had the chance to speak with Dr. Sarah Darwin about her work on the Citizen Science Project, Nightingale City, Berlin. Sarah and her colleagues are working with the Museum for Naturkunde's Animal Sound Library to share and analyze the recordings of the migratory nightingale song, which are submitted by people from all over Berlin. So the idea is um, that in Berlin, every spring, these lovely little brown birds, nightingales, migrate from Africa and they come to Berlin and they sing on every street corner, every park, along railway sidings, in gardens. We're going to have two scientific components. One will be asking the public to go and record the nightingales in their local parks and gardens mm -hmm. and put them onto the website. And then the other will be in the autumn when the weather starts getting a bit dreary. We're going to hopefully train people how to um, analyse the song. Nightingale songs have around a thousand dif different little melodies. Really? Yeah. I, so I try to write... Um, you try to transcribe in my this. tent, and it's not easy. What, well, can um, you maybe okay. recite the poem? Well, it's not really. It is nearly a song, actually, okay. so okay. I, can, I can perform it. Yes, okay. Okay. Good. Um, so it kind of goes... Chick, 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 chick. <laughs> that standing ovation sound. That's really something. Oh, sweet. Well, it doesn't really sound very much like the actual bird, but it's, I was you know, it's a, oh, I you was were, <laughs> Good. Oh, Good. Uh, I love it. Oh. I like playing in the mud. It still has brains on it.